So I want to um, welcome you all this morning. Thank you for joining us here. We are so pleased to be able to present Symposium 13, Legacy Starts Here. It starts with the school you chose to attend. It is grounded in the courses you've taken, in the professors with whom you've studied, in the study groups and crit groups, and the folks with whom you chose to drink and dance. A legacy may well continue to flower in that fertile educational ground sustained by mon monetary gifts. But today, we want to look at the breadth of what may be considered an artist's legacy. What are some of the significant ways in which young artists can begin to define their relationships to institutions, to their peers? How do they begin to position themselves and their artwork within their communities and within the world? How do we sustain these relationships with our peers? How do we find, establish, and sustain mutually rewarding relationships with mentors, with collectors, gallerists, critics, curators? How do we participate and contribute to these established institutions? Or how do we imagine, found, and nurture alternatives? Alternative galleries, magazines, books, online platforms, or even schools? How do we contextualize our work? How do we want to see it framed? understood, and then in what form shall it be disseminated? The mature, sustained art practice presents complex issues of a state and how work will be maintained, supported, and then the stewardship of the artist's legacy, attention, critical review and consideration, significant placement in collections, and philanthropy. These are all concerns of the mature artist. The challenges posed by these interests will be set out for us for examination and discussion in what promises to be a vital forum today. We are very pleased to have these extraordinary panelists to illuminate how we may begin envisioning and building an artist's legacy. I'm so pleased to introduce Takming Chuang, who's one of our most recent alumni. He received his MFA in Berkeley in May 2017. So welcome to the alumni group. <laughs> Tak is the recipient of the Eisner Prize. He's currently in residence at the Headland Center for the Arts. At UC Berkeley, Tak not only participated in campus exhibitions, he took on the enormously challenging and often testing role of coordinating an exhibition of fellow MFA candidates at the Richmond Art Center. There he was working with fellow artists and interfacing with an art center staff on matters from exhibition design to loan agreements and even publicity. If his art practice has been primarily influenced by the ephemeral nature of the human form, it will be very interesting to know how he has framed his approach to bringing his work out into the world. Please welcome Tak. Thank you very much, Jan, for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you to the Worth Writer Gallery, Farley, for organizing this. And thank you all for attending. Uh, can you hear me all? Is this good? Okay. A little louder? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, well, um, this is a little sketch I made in my notebook so that you can kind of get a sense for, well, that I'm new. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm just starting my um, trajectory, uh, my art path, just having graduated. Um, the program, and so I'll be spending the next 10 minutes or so to talk about my practice and also um, how it weaves into the subject of artist legacy. Um, and it might seem odd that I'm talking about artist legacy at the beginning of my uh, professional trajectory, but it is something that I consider deeply and 
it's something that I'd like to illustrate here, that upper triangle. If you can see the word preservation, value, and change. Those are the three themes that I deal with um, when it comes to my creative production. So if things are always changing, I have a fear of aging. So I think that's, what hap that's, wh that's how it all started. Um, I don't like looking in the mirror maybe f three months later and seeing changes in my body. And so I have to work out harder to try to <laughs> maintain the muscle definition or, you know, it's, uh, it's just getting harder and harder. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then that is the nature of impermanence. Um, but then why then do I spend so much time uh, battling that, trying to control, trying to prevent change from happening? And I think it's because it's related to a sense of value. And when you have a definition of yourself, but yet it keeps on changing, you either go with the flow or you try to hold, tightly, hold on tightly to the identity that you've generated for yourself. So, um, and where does this identity come from? Social conditioning? Who decides what's valuable? Um, and so, with legacy, I do wonder sometimes if I'm wasting my time because am I the one that's supposed to be determining if I'm of value to society or if it's the job of an art historian or a job of some people way, way down later, you know. So I think um, this graph shows uh, this, this, what is that, the y-axis or the x-axis? This axis here is the, uh, value. So then maybe I can stand up and show you. This is value, this is the timeline, so as things change, then the, your, my value as an artist goes up and down. And then these are points of maybe legacy. For example, um, a monograph, or um, it enters a museum collection, which I'm very excited to say the Berkeley Art Museum just acquired one of my um, yes. sculptures. So that's very yes. <laughs> um, thank you. Or then an exhibition. Um, then maybe it enters a private collection. So, uh, maybe a retrospective, a book. These are points of legacy where, you know, things are um, somehow preserved in the history of an artist's uh, trajectory. Okay, so uh, recently I was at the Noguchi Museum, and because I knew I was going to participate in the panel, I had written to Jan and uh, Farley about just um, what this artist did regarding legacy. While he was alive, he opened his own museum. I think that's a big deal because he knew how valuable he was. Either he was really self-confident or overconfident or who knows. I mean, but he, he thought he was big, a big deal. And so he opened a, a museum. He died in 1988, Osamu Noguchi, and he's, the museum is still thriving. So obviously, I think that his idea of his self-value meets, uh, meets the value that the public uh, deems of his work. On the opposite end of the spectrum of Usama Noguchi is uh, uh, Buddha, um, Siddhartha, Prince Siddhartha. He's, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up Buddhist, so um, there's a story that says when he was about to die, um, his disciples, his students said, well, how do we remember what you've taught? How do we keep passing that along? And he's like, oh, don't make any effigies of me. Don't write anything down, just um, here's my footprint, and just remember I've walked, I've walked the earth. So I think you might notice who I align with more, either Osamu Noguchi or Prince Siddhartha through the work that I've created here. It's just um, old paintings that I've repurposed. Uh, I used to be a painter, so then I started ripping them apart and then um, standing on them to the point where they would take on the form of my body. And in doing so, I was trying to capture um, the ephemeral body. Struggling with body image, I thought, well, what if I concentrated or focused more on the breath and the body heat? How might I materialize that? So these are objects that were placed in crevices of my body. Um, and so in long periods of interaction, they harden. Um, and they form these like soft sculptures. This was then something I thought was of interest. 
they leave marks on your body after prolonged um, contact. So I started taking photographs, not only just to remember the situation, but also the way my body looked at that particular time. So this was in 2012, I believe. And then I started to uh, make prints and try different forms of archiving my body. So those prints and uh, this sculpture are ways of abstracting um, the body. And I worked with metal and I started to uh, exercise and then transfer my body heat onto brass plates and they leave a patina um, to kind of archive the interaction. Um, here it's the same effect. The sculpture kind of is a testament to the effort and the work that I put in to preserve my body. So the, on the left you'll see the piece with brass and that's using body heat. And then on the right are just um, what I call kernels. Those are old paintings that were ripped up and placed in my uh, nostrils. And so they are symbolic. They um, represent the exhale and inhalation. To be more literal, I started uh, making things that look like preserved food. Um, I was inspired by travels to Norway and I saw a lot of preserved fish meat. Here's something else that was kind of um, inspired by skin that's been preserved, like preserved shark skin, preserved meat. And then here on my Berkeley MFA, uh, I started to work with clay. And uh, Aaron Tool, who is a, uh, also an alumni, um, and the technician there, along with uh, faculty members, kind of guided me through a new material that I thought was very challenging to work with, but somehow brought me so much joy because it emulated, the clay body emulates the, my body so well. And um, after we worked with clay, they would tell us to put a, a plastic sheath over it so it wouldn't dry, and uh, so I could work on it the next day. And I was really interested in this plastic sheath because in some way it was preserving the state of that clay body. It was preserving its moisture, um, and so I started to uh, emphasize the interaction between the clay and the plastic sheath uh, by, I guess, rolling out slabs and then working with it in a very um, sculptural way. And then the plastic became part of the sculpture. It, wasn't, it was no longer something that I would remove. It was, it's, it's a part of the piece itself. But as you can see, as, a, as the sculpture kind of uh, tries to age, it's sucking, it, it dries, and it starts to suck, uh, pull the plastic sheath into it. And those wrinkles are a result of the clay drying within the plastic sheath. Oh, and I should also notice, that, uh, point out the bubbles that happen. It's moisture trying to escape. And so this was, um, here's another piece to give you an example of the, the recent work. How big is that? That is about this, oops, sorry, this big. Yeah, and they're about 60 pounds or more, so they're kind of hefty. But as they lose moisture, they get lighter. Yeah. This one was the piece that was acquired by the Berkeley Art Museum. No, so I don't fire my clay pieces. Yeah. But I think similar to my previous work that you've seen before with the uh, body heat, like this, the tarnished metal, and also the, the sculptural paintings, I don't fix, I don't, um, I don't stabilize the medium. So then, for example, the tarnish will continue to tarnish. And the, the painting, sculptural paintings will, f will flop in high humidity because there's nothing to keep them in that form, except for my body heat. So with these pieces, um, they're likely to deteriorate, which was an issue that the museum had before acquiring it. Mm -hmm. They were curious as to how they might care for it. And here's just an idea of how I think of legacy. These are 
maybe these are really swatches, ways that I'm trying to work with the clay to understand how I can manipulate it. But at the same sense, they resemble uh, artifacts. And I think that, you know, previous people, there's always shards that you can find um, of their culture. And so these are perhaps maybe the shards that I've created somehow to create this story about my own, I guess, my own trajectory, my own development. Um, and then if we talk about legacy, uh, I wrote two lists. One is the new guard and one's the old guard. So the old guard might be galleries, museums, libraries, private and public collections, publications like um, I read Freeze, I read the New York Times, Art Forum, Art News. Also, the artist log. So as artists, what do you keep um, in storage? Now, the new guard is, I guess I'm, st I'm stuck in between. I'm neither young or old. I'm getting older. And I find that people <laughs> are um, using Facebook, um, Instagram, YouTube, self-publishing, all these tools are the new form of legacy. And so it takes away from the importance of the old guard um, or their influence. And then there's this new thing that I don't even use. It's called Snapchat. And it's usually for people under like 25 or under 30 or something. And that is interesting because there's no um, historical record. You, you send out something and then it disappears whether it's a photo or a, um, a text. It disappears and then you don't have a archive of what you wrote, so you can't refer back to it, you know. And it's the most popular thing now. People love using it more so than Instagram and Facebook. Um, so I think about maybe, maybe when I pass or, you know, if my things will be in something like this. <laughs> That's at the VNA. I took that in, in March. Um, and this is what I've always done. I keep, um, it's like scrapbooks whenever I travel. Before my MFA, I was doing a lot of self-research because I didn't study art in my undergrad years. I studied economics, so in order to educate myself, I would travel to see art, and I would create these binders. And not only did I keep like little ticket stubs and restaurant menus, but I also collected um, every single press release um, or map that I came across at a museum or a gallery. And I have several of these binders um, from Taiwan to London to Venice. This is um, also to show you, uh, every time I had an exhibition, I would create this specific size postcard. And I have these postcards dating back to 2009. Um, and I keep, I keep them for my own archive, but I also mail them. And they're all the same size so that they fit a standard envelope. Here's another one of my um, binders. This was from, collected from Taiwan. So that's a high-speed rail pass, but you know, <laughs> kind of archiving, inserting myself into this archive. And this is an uh, image of my Instagram account. Um, this was taken on my smartphone. And I, I'm learning how to use this still. I just, I'm a new member. I started maybe a year ago. And I'm wondering if I'm going to continue this practice here, on manual on paper, or if I should just transfer everything to a digital, you know, so I just have to snap images. Um, but the, the difference with this is it's immediately public. There are people following this, and I'm not necessarily comfortable with having someone immediately, s I need time to reflect, which is why I prefer this more. But I find that now, in the kind of fast culture we live in, people really prefer this kind of model. Um, lastly, I'd like to end with an image of a work that I made in 2016, I think, the beginning of 2016. And to give you an example of how much it's changed, this is how it looks like now in my studio. So really, it's hard to answer the questions at the Berkeley Art Museum when they say, how is this thing going to age? I don't know. Or is my legacy going to be relevant? I don't know. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Tak. That was quite incredible. Yes? Uh, one question, Corey. Yeah. Uh, a professor of mine who taught here, Cindy Gordon, 
favorite uh, line always was, I stand on the shoulders of giants. And my question is to you, what giant do you stand on? Well, the artists that have come before me, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think also we'll have a lot of time to talk later. We'll mm -hmm. have, we, we, they're making very short presentations so we can have a lot of conversation. Yeah. Um, and, and I think what, um, what talk has done that's so wonderful is in fact um, something key to, to, to legacy and to not being um, erased from history. He does talk, I mean, he, he just spoke of Noguchi and he um, spoke of Aaron Toole. I mean, when we, when we, yeah, uh, well, he well, passed um, on it. <laughs> um, yeah, I would like to basically reflect the artists who have come before me, like, Aaron Tool, like Osama Noguchi, those are the artists that I think, the shoulders that I stand on. Um, and not just artists though, I would say. I think maybe world leaders as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that was a wonderful presentation and so much to think about. Um, we, I, I'm, I'm very pleased that Tracy Friedman has joined us um, today. Tracy is an art business advisor and um, a private art dealer. She uh, is the owner of Friedman Art Advisory, where she offers business and marketing guidance to artists and gallerists and advises private collectors as well. Tracy is the co-owner of uh, and director of Hackett Friedman Gallery in San Francisco from 1987 to 2009, representing contemporary artists and specializing in post-war American and California art. Um, Tracy has much experience with um, some wonderful estates, um, particularly the estate of David Park. Um, Tracy has been, um, she was past president is past president of the San Francisco Art Dealers Association. She serves on the local executive committee and national board of Art Table, a leading organization in advancing professional women's leadership in the visual arts. Tracy Friedman has advocated for artists and she has stewarded the estates of artists who could no longer do so themselves. Thank you so much for being with us. Tracy, please welcome. Thank you, Jan. Um, well, I can skip a slide now because you covered uh, the about me beautifully. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thanks to Farley. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so uh, I did a kind of, uh, well, I'm known for being very direct. And it's a good thing I was in private business because I am not, um, it's not that I can't collaborate or take other people's opinions, but um, uh, we were talking about this a little bit before. It is harder to work in a collaborative mode when it comes to aesthetics, I think. And uh, there is a lot of my practice as a gallerist or as a, a private um, consultant, you know, I, I think taste matters and I think um, opinions matter. And it's hard to neutralize all that or to, um, negotiate. So I've done a lot of things where I didn't have to negotiate too much. I had a business partner for 25 years. That was negotiation and of course um, wanting to rely on staff. But um, I, uh, I, in this case, I'm going to give you a kind of opinionated um, and direct how-to, in my view, what people, um, artists at different stages might consider in addition to their actual art practice. Uh, as part of their as part of their job, and uh, I think Takshin made a very clear that as a young artist, he's already very well aware that there's a lot of uh, ups and downs uh, in terms of visibility, self worth, uh, attention, etc. That that come in a, an artist's career, but that perhaps you have some control over that, uh, at least for your own satisfaction, if not for what the world thinks. And after all. Most artists are unaffiliated. Most artists are doing work that they consider important or critical to their own happiness or survival. Um, and that's what it is to be an artist. And I have the utmost respect regardless of what uh, the economy thinks or the, uh, the pundits think, right? You're, you're doing it and that's the key thing. So anyway. Um, 
about me, we can skip. Um, I'm going to go into the uh, standard hard truths you already know. No one can say if your art's going to be remembered. Uh, you can commit, however, to documenting your work, your process, and your thinking. And I think that is uh, a valuable thing for every sentient being to do in some way, shape, or form, but particularly artists. Today, it's really easy, cheap, and worth the trouble to maintain good records and to keep them safe. And uh, this is the best part of the digital revolution, right? You can, you can uh, store things on Dropbox. You can get flash drives and put them in six different houses. You can um, store things on the cloud and physically very cheaply. And you can, uh, with a pretty good camera, good digital camera, not a cell phone necessarily, uh, <laughs> you can document your work. And, the, you know, a lot of people start out not doing much of this, and um, later on, someone's interested, a gallerist or a show, and it's everything's a mess, or they can't find things. Where did that go? Um, you know, I'm not suggesting you become accountants, but I think it's, it's really important at every stage to start working on that. Um, the other thing that already has been alluded to, and I think is, is absolutely part of the 21st century, is to find your own special audience. And that may not be through a gallery. That may not be in a museum show. It may not be um, uh, in a traditional mode. Uh, and I'll talk more about that. But I think that you have control over your work and your ideas. And that is the driver here that uh, you get to work with as opposed to feeling ignored or passive or rejected. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, who's seeing your work and what they get to, to know about it. Um, so emerging artists, um, I'm, again, I think you need to establish good habits and set some goals, if possible, for your own work and for your own marketing. And um, I would uh, definitely start a database or at a minimum a spreadsheet and keep track of everything. FileMaker is a great database that is not very hard to use. And if you have a little money or a friend who you can swap skills with, get that set up. You have your pictures, all your information. You can add as many fields and notes as you want. And it works like a dream. Uh, photograph and register all your work, etc. Stay in touch with your buyers and fans. And we'll talk more about that, but um, I, I think the easiest way for most people is anything ranging from a phone call to a postcard of a, a, some sort of exhibition to Facebook, Instagram, and social media. Um, and uh, finding your audiences is, is at least a two-step process or a, a shuffle between online and on earth. And uh, I don't think you can ignore either one. the moment. <laughs> um, Mid-career, I think, uh, is not very different, but I do think it's a good time to evaluate and reset some goals. Um, maybe you've had several shows, you've been in some invitationals, you've won a couple of little awards, you've been included in this, that, or the other thing. Uh, you've had a, a, some solo shows, your gallery went out of business. Um, they no longer are selling, whatever. There's all kinds of reasons to sort of wake up and say, okay, you know, I've been doing this 20 years. There's a lot more years ahead. Do I want to reset anything? Do I want to reinvigorate my practice? Um, I think being open to new opportunities is harder and harder as we get more used to our, our mode. And we have our set of friends and our, our set of contacts. Um, when, I, when the gallery closed and I had to become a, you know, an independent consultant, it was actually very exciting because I had to do a lot of outreach. And I had to um, really take a look at the state of the Bay Area art world and national art world in a way that I had not had to as a gallerist. I had my, my well-trodden paths that I you know, knew, and I suddenly had to open that all up. And it was really a marvelous experience. I went out and saw 
a lot of galleries I had never set foot in. You'd think as a gallerist I would have, but I was too busy. And I had my mode, and they were in some other mode. So, you know, there's constant, and this is a great time in the Bay Area right now, uh, there is a, a real blossoming uh, despite the economic tensions and lack of housing, et cetera, et cetera, that are so difficult for artists. There's also a great flowering of richer institutions that are, uh, and nonprofits as always, that are um, invigorated, much more invigorated than they have been in the whole time I've lived out here, I would say, and that's 40 years. That's my personal view. SF MoMA, massive infusion of energy. Uh, Berkeley Art Museum, massive infusion of energy. The um, <clears throat> Headlands reopening, and uh, a lot of institutions, the, the surviving institutions have improved their, uh, their resources and funding. I think they're much more stable. They're gonna be around a long time. They have new leadership, most of them. Uh, interestingly, many women leaders, when I went through, I made a little list of nonprofit, just that I could come up with the top of my head of exhibition spaces or places that have um, juried exhibitions or things like that around the area. Most of them are led by really dynamic women. It's kind of a great period. Um, I can go further, but. Uh, so back to shake up your habits. You know, submit for a different kind of, uh, for a residency or a grant. Look into what's, what opportunities there are. There are a lot of mid-career artist opportunities you may not even know about. Again, Google is your friend here. Um, explore a new media, travel, get around and, and stimulate yourself in ways that you have not lately. Um, develop new ways to showcase your own work. And uh, that may be a collaboration with other artists or other people in other genres. That may be working in new media, uh, curating a show of other artists, writing. Um, although a lot of publications are under duress, as is everything these days from the internet, uh, the internet is not under duress. And there's a lot of ways to write without as many barriers as there may have been in the past if you like to write. If you, um, artists are often incredibly good critics, I think, and uh, very thoughtful, articulate people. So there's all kinds of ways to increase your brand, dare I say it, and your visibility in to a specific audience. It may not be a big audience, but you will find that you, the more you do things and the more you let them, the public know about them, the more people will find you. And um, there's a lot of social media primers out there and a lot, uh, that's a whole separate discussion, but it is uh, not a very, um, what would I say? There's very few barriers. It's mostly using your own network to start expanding that network. Okay, you're a mature artist. Maybe you're in your 60s, 80s, somewhere, hundreds. More and more. How old is Carmen Herrera? Uh, some of these people who've just been rediscovered are in their late 90s. Um, set goals for managing your work now and posthumously. Very important. Uh, if you haven't digitized, get some help and do, do so. Get, get your work documented. Uh, and if you have notes or other ephemera you want to attach to some of those works, make sure that it's put together as well as you can. Uh, you may be able to find an intern even here at Berkeley in the art history department or some such opportunity. Uh, there's a lot of people who would love to work with an artist to help them. Uh, include your family in the process of thinking about the future. Um, consider self-publishing some work. As, as Takshin said, it's very cost-effective and nice to do. You can do a uh, again, using online publishing companies that you send digital, your digital images, text, and design to, they have design templates, it can be $25 a book. You can make 10 and be done with it, but give them to your family. 
it's very, uh, the barriers again are very low and um, they, most of these companies have um, designers you can actually work with if you like um, and you can uh, publish as many images or as few as you want in any kind of softbound, hardbound. It's kind of a marvelous opportunity. And um, if, if your work is ephemeral or if you are not planning to save all your work because it is going to be very difficult to do so and uh, too expensive, there's no space, get some stuff in print as well as uh, digitally documented. And everyone in your family and friends will be very happy to have this legacy in print form. Uh, another thing I would consider doing is pub making gifts to institutions and individuals. Uh, if you know of people who like the work and would appreciate it and you don't have a better, higher use for it that you can come up with soon, donate. Artist Trust is uh, something you're going to hear a lot more about, and I am not uh, an expert, but I do think um, they are worth investigating. More and more artists are doing them. Uh, big question, does it fit your needs and resources? They, estates do require some money, some patience, and someone to, at least one person, to do a heck of a lot of work over a long period of time to try and stabilize uh, what happens to the work in that trust, uh, unless you are independently wealthy, in which case it's maybe a little easier. Uh, you can investigate what is involved in an artist trust through free primers and workshops. Uh, the Joan Mitchell Foundation um, has a fantastic series of tools and uh, online workshops. Uh, there are many others being organized at uh, Intersection for the Arts in San Francisco and many other places. You'll hear more. But um, that is something you can get your hands on online to begin with. I also made up a quick reading list uh, of some uh, books and articles. If anyone wants them, I can email them to you. I made a couple printed copies. Um, be sure you discuss all of these thoughts and issues with your family. Will they help? Is there money? Is there interest? Some families are not very close. Some families don't think your art is, you know, they, they, they're going to feel guilty about the art when you're gone. And if you haven't done anything about it, they're going to really be in a very uncomfortable situation. What do they do with it? Help them out. Think about the money, think about the, the disposition of the art. Let them know what you can let go of or what they can let go of. Don't just drop it in their laps. Uh, there's free legal advice, California Lawyers for the Arts and others um, publish a lot of advice on trusts and other ways that artists' estates can be managed. And key thing is think it through and establish a clear plan. So back to cultivating your audience. Uh, again, there are inexpensive ways to make a website now and have it hosted online for a low monthly fee. Uh, they take care of all the headaches. Squarespace and all these companies, worth thinking about. If you don't have your own website and you are relying on a place you work or um, a gallery, Think about whether that is serving your purpose. Many artists now have their own websites. They can be quite minimal, but it is something you control. And I think that's worth thinking about. Um, there's Squarespace and uh, Wix, which people find very easy to use. And there's a third one. Um, WordPress, but that's harder. Yeah, WordPress, but there's another one. Um, I'll think of it. Cargo Collective is another Cargo Collective. If you Google uh, Weebly, is or, or Weebly, yeah, yeah. W-E-E-B-L-Y. Um, <clears throat> social media, again, is not as frightening as all that. Um, we know that different age groups use different social media. 
we, uh, as a late comer to Facebook, I remain confused about it. Um, many people my age don't ever look at it. Uh, a lot of my friends I may be friends with, but they don't see anything. Uh, I Instagram, um, I am using more um, to document shows I like or things I find interesting out there. Uh, and that seems, it's very easy. It's also easy to edit the images so they look good uh, because my photography skills are not great. Um, I, uh, I think it's a challenge in all respects, but when I see it done well, um, it's clear that Facebook can be very effective. Uh, I know of uh, several uh, contemporary artists that I showed who when my gallery closed were left with less effective dealers or no dealers. These are good active artists who are working full time teaching or otherwise. They started working heavily using Facebook, expanding their uh, their circle. You have to get involved in comp in discussions on Facebook to to expand your circle. You can't just post things and never, you know. But you get you do it with your artist friends, your peers. You start expanding the circle. Um, these people have been extremely effective in getting themselves gigs, museum shows, books. How did they get noticed by people who they didn't know previously? There was no gallerist working on their behalf. They did it because they had a large presence on Facebook, an active presence. They will shoot pictures of themselves in uh, work in process, some of them. Uh, they go traveling, they're, they're just posting. It's simple, it's not difficult, it is uh, not for everyone. But I think it's, it's a very um, Im impressive uh, thing to see and um, they're not doing anything, they're not pandering to an audience, they're just doing their work, but they are keeping their, their face and their work out in front of people and keeping um, writers and curators and friends and fans and collectors engaged. And uh, the more they post, the more likely I am to follow them, right? That's how Facebook works. So things to consider. And uh, get it, dipping your toe in doesn't mean you have to go 100%. You can try it and see how it feels. Um, I would also consider new platforms as they arrive. I can't tell you what they're going to be, but you got to keep your ear to the ground and uh, maybe it's a new form of a, an art fair. There's suddenly now these artist uh, ex exhibitor art fairs. Is that called startup art fair? They've done it two or three times in San Francisco. Local people run it. Is that useful? Uh, you know, think outside your own box. Think outside the box you grew up in. It is all under change, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of options that you may not have considered, or it may be an old an old style option that you haven't tried in a long time will pay off. Um, I I would say to everyone, if you're not active in your community, find a little community to volunteer in. Maybe it's helping out at a gallery once a month. Maybe it's uh, helping organize something. Uh, swap skills with friends who have skills you need. And continually offering your opportunities to people brings them in. Again, you know, you can bring in um, mentors and curators and people who you've been in contact with over the years Invite them to do something, and then they will help you with something. There's, you know, a lot of just interpersonal uh, skills there that um, are not that difficult, but we don't always think to use them in our own behalf. And as someone told me, if you don't ask, no one gives. Whatever the question is, you have to ask, and not always easy. But um, uh, again, another. Uh, artist, you know, who's been 20 years out of grad school has kept in touch with some of the, uh, the people who taught there. And now 20 years later, you know, one of those, those art historians that he knew from there um, is writing an essay for his book. And it's not, not because he sucked up to him all these years, but he managed to invite him to do a couple things. He stayed in touch when it seemed relevant uh, and uh, artistically relevant. And here we go. So 
I think these things build on themselves and you have to take a, um, a long view and you have to start with what you know and let the circles expand outward. Uh, workshops, talks, uh, reviews, all these things can be time consuming, but they can also be very rewarding as well as helpful. So in conclusion, uh, hang in there. <laughs> And uh, I, I wish you all well. Thank you. I just want to pick on, up on one note as they're switching seats. Volunteer. Did you hear that word from Tracy? Volunteer. Um, there, there's a book by, edited by Sharon Loudon of 40 artists living and sustaining a creative life. And if you read through these 40 essays, you'll find that um, almost all of those artists speak of their volunteering and how they really made connections and started um, finding a place for themselves through volunteering. And certainly the Art alumni group might be a place to start <laughs> because we would welcome you all. As you know, um, Car Carol Ladwig was a fantastic, fantastic um, force in the art alumni group and as a president and working for this um, symposium, a symposium in the past, and this one too, even though she couldn't be with us today, she's with us. And, and we are so grateful that Farley has taken on the mantle now. But do consider joining us um, for meetups and for um, planning sessions and make sure that we as a group can provide what you would be interested in and what you would like. So um, to follow that, uh, Farley Guasta received his um, MFA from the Art Practice Department here in 2009. He has served as director of the Worth Rider Art Gallery here at UC Berkeley. He is now our new president of the UC Berkeley Art Alumni Group. Uh, Farley, speaking of, of different things to set out for and um, new paths, was a founder, uh, co-founder and director, co-founder, co-director of a very important small exhibition space. It, um, the Martina Johnston Gallery um, was founded with Indira Martina Murray, who's here, who um, is also on faculty and has been a great supporter of artists. And they created a space which was a wonderful place for young artists coming out of Berkeley to, to have their first exhibitions and was really vital to the community. Uh, Farley is the director of the Sonia Rapoport Legacy Trust, which endeavors to preserve the artworks and promote the legacy of the artist Sonia Rapoport, 1923 to 2015. We, re we recently lost Sonia. Sonia also received her MA in painting from the Department of Art in 1949 here at Berkeley. Um, we are so pleased to have Farley with us sharing his experiences and information and uh, all his wisdom about what is entailed in setting up a trust and working forward with it. Please welcome Farley. Thank you, Jan. So you folks can hear me in the back? Is this working? Okay, great. Um, well, it really is such an honor to um, speak here today. Um, with the art alumni group. Um, this is very meaningful for me because I actually met Sonia through the art alumni group at one of our holiday gatherings at Nancy Gens. So um, I, I uh, have a feeling of things coming full circle here. Um, and I, it's such an honor to be on stage with, with Tak and Tracy. And Tak, I'm so interested in what you said about the questions of how, of whether an artist makes his or her own legacy or whether it's made for them by others and by institutions. And I think that um, listening to you talk and, and Tracy listening to you speak uh, with more specific advice about how individual artists can prepare for their legacy, um, this is something that we'll be discussing in, in more length. 
Um, I'm not going to speak the way Tracy did, um, giving direct advice to artists on the concept of legacy. Rather, I'm going to be speaking uh, specifically about my experience with Sonia and setting up the trust. Um, hopefully, it will be um, a useful case study to see how it was done in, in Sonia's case. Um, and I, I hope it's interesting, especially because I know many of us knew Sonia. Um, here we have uh, just, you know, kind of plugging the website, soniarapaport.org. Um, not only uh, speaks about the Sonia Rappaport Legacy Trust, but of course is an artist website for Sonia, who as um, a pioneering web artist um, didn't really have her own artist site. So um, that's one of the things that, that I've worked to put together. I also want to um, begin by um, thanking the artist agents that I work with, uh, agents and historians, Ala Efimova and Terry Cohn, who's here. Hi, Terry, um, who literally wrote the book on Sonia. Thank you, Terry. Um, so I wanted to start by reading just part of the mission statement of the SRLT, um, which I wrote together with Sonia uh, before she died in 2015, um, where she really laid out what she wanted to happen with her work and with her legacy after she passed. Um, so just to give you an idea of, of what a document like this might look like. The SRLT exists to preserve and expand the artistic legacy of Sonia Rappaport, to expose her artwork to a broad audience, and to foster critical and art historical scholarship and research on her work. Essential to this mission is the cataloging, protection, and preservation of the artworks in her estate, including paintings, drawings, interactive installations, videos, and electronic and web-based works, so a wide variety of, of media that make this both interesting and challenging. Um, see, an important goal is to focus on strategic sales, donations, or other placement of this artwork in museums, appropriate public or private art collections, or other relevant institutions that can broaden the access to and increase the understanding of her work. So this is just the beginning of a document that we made together. Um, so hopefully this illustrates that being intentional with what you want to see happen to your work. Um, you know, it's kind of a new agey thing. Visualize it and it will happen. Um, resources help too. Um, some, other, some other things that Sonia and I discussed um, to put her trust together. The website, again, I said Sonia didn't have one. Um, central to the trust is the inventory of her work, which was begun during her lifetime by Sonia and other people like Terry and Anu Vikram and Joni Spigler and uh, Jeannie Friedland, a bunch of other assistants that Sonia had. So she had a long history of working with artist assistants to put together an inventory. Um, and we actually put that inventory in FileMaker Pro, and I'm gonna show you a short example of that later to give you a specific example. Catalog raisonné. Um, the catalog raisonné differs from the inventory just in that the inventory covers what's in the estate and works that belong to the family that are in our possession. Um, the catalog raisonné, which um, if you aren't familiar with that term, is just a, a, a catalog of all the objects that an artist has produced, including works that are in collections. Um, that's a bigger project, and I'm certainly still working on it. Um, and if any of you happen to have any of Sonia's work, come. Uh, talk to me because I'm, uh, I'm always searching for it. Uh, ongoing process. And then the final thing that we're going to talk about is the uh, use of the archives at the Bancroft Library, the, the, the process of putting it together. Here's Sonia on the left um, around the time that she graduated from the, this department. Of course, it wasn't in this building, which was built in 1960. So she got her MA in painting here and studied with, with people like Earl Loren and um, is very much influenced by the Berkeley School. This is a, a picture of the um, Hearst Pool on the right in the uh, kind of uh, very early 
style that Sonia was doing as a, as a young student. Um, as I said, I met Sonia through the art alumni group. Here she is in the middle, um, wearing one of her fabulous necklaces, um, along with my, my partner, Indira, on the left, and um, curator Katie and Nania, who uh, this is actually at Martina Johnston Gallery that Jen was mentioning earlier, which was um, in our living room, in our kitchen. Um, Sonia had an exhibition at the Martina Johnston Gallery. Um, it was, I think it was a one-day show. She called it a data gathering event. So this is typical of Sonia's later work. Um, and I know that some of you might be familiar with Sonia's um, later work, which differs radically from the, the uh, painting that I was showing earlier. Um, this was an, an event where she was working on these New York Times pages on the wall. Um, and creating collages of her older work. She also showed some of her older work. That's a painting called Bullseye 1967, which you see on the, on the right there, on the floor of the shaped canvas, book-shaped canvas. Um, data gathering event here, it was basically people were matching um, images and phrases from advertising. Um, I'm not gonna go into depth about what that project was, but there's certainly lots of details on the website. I just kind of wanted to show my earliest engagement with Sonia's practice. Um, we videotaped people speaking about why they made the connections they made, and then um, Sonia originally approached me at the art alumni group uh, gathering and said, I, ne I need you to edit some video. So that's how our, our, um, our period of working together started. Okay, I'm gonna go really quickly and give a very, very brief bio. And this is very difficult for me because I like to talk at length about Sonia. So um, I'm giving you this bio just to illustrate the breadth of the work that's in um, Sonia's estate. So this is an early abstract expressionist piece, 1957, I believe, uh, on paper. Paper represents a challenge, um, a conservation challenge. Some pictures of Sonia in the studio as a, as a uh, abstract expressionists doing these large paintings that were um, exhibited at the Palace of the Legion of Honor in a solo show in 1967. Um, and Sonia in the studio with her son Robert. I love it. Um, so moving, Sonia would always push the boundaries of her, um, like Tracy was saying, re reinvent your art practice, push, try something new. And Sonia was always trying something new. So moving on from Abex paintings, I think she, she grew weary of abstract expressionism. And here, again, is the shaped canvas, which is actually rendered on a piece of kind of gaudy, uh, funky fabric. Um, this piece is called Bullseye. Um, this piece, Coke II, um, 1974, I believe, um, was recently appeared at the Hippie Modernism show at the Berkeley Art Museum. Um, and is this is a large painting, probably eight feet wide, um, pattern painting. And it's actually an airbrush work. Um, it w these paintings were created um, from this, she called it her Pandora's box full of stencils. Um, you can see on the lower left there, um, kind of hiding down there, there's a, a, a stencil that's shaped kind of like a triangle, um, and you can see it repeated many times in this, and that was part of her, she called it her new shoe language. It represents a uterus, so it's a, a, her feminist language that's related to the body, and it's got all these stencils. Here's another work which is in the collection that's got to be about 12 feet wide. Um, very exciting to discover this work. Uh, which I had not seen before Sonia passed. This one, I would guess 1976. This is around the, the last of Sonia's paintings because she would, um, she would, she had been painting for a long time and would move away from painting. This piece is called Survey Chart Number 19, 1971. Um, at a certain point, just like she was working on fabric, Sonia started working. She never wanted to work on a blank canvas. She always wanted to work on something that already had uh, existing information and images in it. So these, this is her survey chart series, and she's actually working on antique survey charts. And just like talk, I'm very pleased to announce that this piece was recently acquired by the Berkeley Art Museum. Um, it's, a, it's a drawing on antique paper. 
Um, again, you can see the um, black w wavy thing there. Does anyone, can anyone guess what that bla black wavy shape is? Other than Terry, who knows? <laughs> yeah. It's not. It has a, it, you know what it is? It's, um, if you've ever played pool and you have to make a, a, a shot in the middle of the table, you get this little bridge, right? Yeah, that's what that is. So Sonia called it um, her uh, utter shape. So again, <laughs> feminist, bo feminist body symbols. Uh, here's a picture of the same work. You can see it's signed 1971. Sign your work. Tell us when you did it or else, you know. So this is an important part of legacy. And you can also see some of the beautiful detail in this work. Moving on, um, Sonia started to work on computer paper in the late 70s. Uh, this is a, one of her yarn drawings. This is large, probably five feet wide. Um, multiple um, com computer printout papers, the, the old fashioned kind with the sprocket holes on the side. Um, which is tied together with yarn. Um, Sonia would then start to actually get in, she initially was interested in the paper just because it looked neat, and certainly at the time it was very futuristic looking. Um, now it looks old fashioned. But um, computers, she became very involved in computers and actually started collaborating to create printouts on computer papers. This is a collaboration with an anthropologist and mathematician named Dorothy Washburn. This is the Anasazi series, and it all relates to Anasazi pottery. Um, again, I can't go into too much detail because, you know, a book, a book is on its way in a couple decades, just you wait. Um, <laughs> so here's, um, so Sonia would then move away from a painting and drawing and go towards audience participation, performances, often computer mediated. So this is um, one of her, uh, I mean, I think it's a masterpiece. Objects on my dresser, starting in 1979. These are an, an, a photograph of objects on her dresser, numbered for analysis. Um, so what does it mean, numbered for analysis? Audience participation performance in her studio. She would invite people in and essentially have them match these different objects. They're, these are cards on the floor of the different objects and the different the different, she would ask people to rearrange them. And then what she would do is record those arrangements, uh, tabulate them, put them on a computer punch card, and print them out to create these very um, gra graph-like, actually these are plotter print, which is kind of an outmoded uh, form of computer printing, um, which are kind of a digital portrait of her subjects and she did portraits of herself. Throughout the 80s, she would do computer interactive performance. This is uh, a, a fabulous project, Biorhythm, 1981. Um, as you see, these very early computers. So you would go to the uh, gallery, and there would actually be a computer there. And I think in 1981, that was quite unusual. And uh, a lot of people really hadn't encountered computers in person at that point. This is also biorhythm. Sonia never became a 100% digital artist. She always returned to the physical. Um, so this would be a, a, a calendar that records her personal biorhythm, you know, which relates to the body through these, these large collages. In the 80s, Sonia did book art. She did um, the, this uh, animated soul, which is kind of a choose your own adventure of the Egyptian book of the dead book. Um, and on the right, Digital Mudra, which was also a computer interactive performance. This is also Digital Mudra. So what you see on the, um, sorry, right here is the, the book that she created. So how do you, how do you mark it? How, like, how do you make an object out of a um, computer interactive installation? Um, make a book. It's at, this actually, the V&A um, has a copy of this book. Or is that Shoefield? Oh, maybe they have a similar copy. This is uh, 1987 through 89, um, Sonia's first interactive uh, web-based artwork. So if you had asked me whether the internet was around in 1987, I probably would have guessed no, but here it is. Um, so it was very early interactive. And, and this is a, a later um, interactive computer piece. So that's, that's the fastest that I can do Sonia's bio. <laughs> um, what we have here 
is the online archive of California. So this is the Bancroft Library um, web page. This is a publicly accessible web page um, of the Rappaport Sonia papers, um, which is the archive of Sonia's life's work. Um, Sonia was very much a research-based artist, and she saved everything. And Sonia and I, and actually many of her previous assistants, who I've named earlier, did a lot of work to put together this archive, which was acquired by the Bancroft in 19, uh, sorry, 2014, before Sonia died. Uh, here's Sonia on the day that they picked up her archive in the banker boxes, so 30 banker boxes full of research, um, something like 37,000 pages. Um, it's all in the library, so this is available for research, um, and uh, this is an important part of an artist's legacy. Um, However, John Hell Jr., who uh, actually kind of got me started, is a fabulous uh, male, M-A-I-L artist um, and archivist, uh, kind of advised us towards the beginning of the process. And he said, it's, it's, unless it has an inventory, it's just a pile of papers. Okay, so you, how do you make an archive? You have to know what's there. So basically, you know, writing down what was in each folder, um, it, you know, just a, a basic description, counting the pages, making sure th like things were with like. Um, this is in the Bancroft. So this is a picture taken from the reading room. You can see the little um, paper down on the bottom that shows which box and folder it's in. This is, again, is the Anasazi series. What fascinates me about um, the archive is that it's just a, it's just a fabulous research resource for research. Um, here we have, again, the Anasazi um, drawing. Again, this is about yay big. There are many pages of this. And here we have a um, page from the archive. And if you look at the top, you can see these kind of different shaped uh, right and oblique triangles. And you can see these same triangles in this paper, right? So um, primary source research. Here we, here's, again, biorhythm. Um, calendar that I showed you earlier, and here is actually the original um, pocket calendar, also January 1980, that Sonia uh, used to record her biorhythm and her, her feelings for each day. Um, so again, that's, that's available, and when we sign the contract with the Bancroft, available in perpetuity, which as Sonia liked to say is a long time. Um, Coke 2 with the um, the uh, stencils that I said were represented a uterus. Um, I can prove that because they're, it's in the archives. Um, <laughs> note the uterine cross section in these paintings represents woman. I love it. I just, you know, it's just a, a scrap of paper. Um, here is an inventory of uh, her uh, paintings at the Bowles Gallery in the late 60s, early 70s with prices. Right? So um, again, Tracy was saying, keep a record of your work. This is going to be very valuable when I put together the catalog raisonne, um, because tracing where the work went is very, uh, you know, it can be challenging if you don't keep uh, a good records. And Sonia kept decent records. I mean, um, it, it's really hard to keep a perfect record. Um, but there's some great resources. Um, l let me speed up a little bit. Um, Sonia's. This is so during the process of putting together the archive, Sony was also making artwork about the process of putting together the archive um, because that's what she was an artist and that's what she had to do, right? Um, so here we have, a, again, she was very interested in the New York Times and she was working with um, a book called The Modern Moves West by the art historian Richard Candida Smith. Um, and she was very interested in a chapter about Jay DeFeo, who is actually an undergrad when Sonia was uh, and getting her MA here. Um, so they were kind of on campus at the same time. Um, so this is a kind of piece about Sonia and Jay DeFeo and her archives. It's, a, it's complicated and interesting. Um, and actually, uh, Ala Efimova and Terry Cohn uh, wrote a book about this piece, a, 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 a catalog, which is actually on the desk in front, so maybe after this we can, you can take a look at that. Yes or no is the name of the project and the catalog. Uh, on the bottom here we have images by um, 
Berkeley art professor Earl Lauren, who wrote a, a book called Cezanne's Compositions, which is a kind of arch formalist um, approach to Cezanne, fascinating, one of Sonia's mentors. More from Yes and No. Uh, yes and No is installed at Crow's Work Gallery in Oakland. Here's the whole series. Um, this show is actually a posthumous show um, because Sonia uh, passed away before actually finishing. Well, she finished Yes or No, and she didn't finish this piece, which was called um, The Transit of Property of Equality, which I finished according to her specific specifications. Um, again, objects on my dresser. So this, you can see that this is an extension of objects on my dresser, which started in 1979. Um, here it is in 1979 in her studio. Um, after Sonia died, um, I had to organize the artworks in her studio. Um, so, you know, conservation, wrapping them for storage. Um, this is an image from an open studio. More images from the open studios. Built painting racks and put these paintings together. Uh, me with Ala and Terry and a guest at the open studios, um, enjoying speaking about Sonia's work. Here's um, <laughs> just a random uh, part of one of Sony's installations, which is bagged and numbered, right? So there's an inventory number for each object. Um, I thought I would include this in a picture of the back of the painting. Don't ever remove these tags. This, this is where history starts, you know? Um, so it, these were extraordinarily valuable. Um, here's a picture from the FileMaker Pro um, inventory. Um, Again, it's still it's in process, but the, you're basically describing the title of the work. You've got an object number, which is a very specific number, which is structured in a certain way so we can keep track of it. Um, says what kind of uh, era it's from. It says it's a, the medium is painting. It says the condition is fair because there's some damage to the, to the fabric, right? So you know, little condition report. It's not like a professional appraiser's condition, just enough to get a sense of it. Here is Sonia's work in storage, climate-controlled storage. Um, it's packed really tight. <laughs> storage can be expensive, right? Um, all the numbered boxes, archival boxes, which are quite an expense. Um, I, I thought I would end with um, something unique about Sonia is that she always did return to her work. And she expressed that her trust should encourage others to return to her work the same way that she did. Um, so to that end, she put some language in um, the kind of founding papers of the SRLT, saying the SRLT encourages innovative approaches to expanding and reinventing Sonia Rappaport's body of work through new collaborations with artists, curators, educators, and scholars. These collaborations are guided not only by the existing body of work and the topics, in which Sonia Rappaport was interested, but by her methodologies of artistic research. Um, and so to that end, um, uh, Christina Dutton and Majel Connery are two um, musicians uh, who are very interested in, in music as research and public presentations. And they're putting together a, a new composition based on Sonia's 1980 interactive installation shoe field. Um, so I think that that's kind of a, a, a generous thing that so Sonia did in kind of encouraging people to reapproach her work. Okay. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'd love to um, have questions I'm sure you have. What I'm going to ask you, I understand that we can all hear each other, but because we want this on camera and um, have a record of it, if you could come up here and use this microphone to ask questions, that would be terrific. Um, first person. No questions? So I've got a question about Sonia's work in terms of reappropriation and copyright. Yeah. So how are you approaching that in terms of her legacy? I, 
That's a great question. Copyright is, um, copyright's a very challenging um, topic. I guess that I would say I haven't, I haven't thought about selling that work and I think that that's kind of a, a way of dodging the question because we're not talking about like where does the income come from. Um, in, in terms of the musical piece that involves Shoefield, I think it's clear that as a musical collaboration with an artist who's deceased, that Son Sonia's estate would maintain the copyright for the images from the original work and then the, the uh, any kind of remixing of Sonia's, uh, they're planning to remix recordings of Sonia's voice that are actually from the Bancroft archive, which are being currently digitized thanks to a grant from the um, uh, Calisphere and the Internet Archive, um, that they would have copyright to that material. Um, but it's an excellent and challenging question. I think uh, in the end, I would say I'm gonna cross that bridge when I get to it, yeah. I, I think this is easier with music when we've seen uh, musicians who have sung along and made duos with dead singers. And their um, copyright is held by both, and so royalties go to both the estate and to the contemporary artist. Um, and so I think it would depend on how Sonia's work was incorporated in the um, new art, probably. Yes, and I think also <laughs> Sonia kind of got a kick out of maybe m making a situation that questioned authorship and, and kind of made some challenges for us to, to think about those questions themselves too, right? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm interested in the money. Mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, what kind of funds were um, available to establish the trust? Um, thanks, Tracy. So, you know, I, I wanna make as much public as I can to share with all of you um, uh, because I, I do want this to be instructive. Um, and yet, I also do wanna keep things quite private. And I'm, I'm not saying this because because I am, am going to answer the question, but um, you know, I, I think it's I think it's important to to think about what a personal process this is, and you know how hard it is to make these kinds of plans specifically because you're confronting your mortality, right? Also, you're dealing with family members, and you know that's not always 100% easy for any of us. Um, but Sonia was, Sonia was privileged in that she did have some money put aside to take care of her artwork. Um, I think that it was, so, Sonia's estate was just absolutely massive. She was in the same studio for almost 50 years. Her career was 65 years. She was the kind of person who kept everything out of those 30, five banker boxes, that was probably about half of the material that we started out with, that we eliminated. So um, it, she had set aside some money a while back in, in what's called a survivor's trust, and then she specifically earmarked the money for the trust, right? Um, now, this was kind of a, a bigger operation, as I'm, as I'm hinting at, but I also think that this can be done in any scale. There are very few artists that have uh, quite an ex a extensive estate as, as Sonia had. So just because you don't have um, a, a bank account full of money doesn't mean you can't set aside something. Um, also, I would say, and I want to talk about the image that's on the screen, maybe towards the end, though. We were talking about mutual aid, and especially um, uh, skill trades and stuff like that. So the Art Alumni Group is putting together this um, community and mutual aid directory, which I'm hoping will be a way of, for artists of different, well, similar generation peers as well as people from different generations to get in touch with, with each other and, and find what they can kind of skill trade. And that, and that could be a resource as well. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. I, I'd like to, um bring up a question that came, came to mind um, when I was working with the Joan Brown 
archive at the Bancroft, and that is, since you have this experience, Farley, where the decision is made, how the decision is made and where it falls in terms of what is put into storage as an artwork and what goes into the archive, because what we were seeing from Sonia was a lot of work that um, could find a market at some point in time and could be, um, it seemed, um, you know, it, it had its own integrity and could exist as an artwork as opposed to being of research only value and, and papers. And, mm -hmm. and I think this came up with, with the Joan Brown estate also. And could you speak to that? How Sonia made decisions about what would go into those banker's boxes? Well, I mean, it's such a, it's such a great question because it's really like, what is art, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but uh, you know, when, when we were looking at what goes into the archive versus what would stay in the estate, um, we were, you know, there was a lot of gray area, that's for certain. <coughs> and a lot of it um, had to do with kind of Sonia's intuitive decisions. Um, a lot of her works on paper she thought were pretty fragile. And since the Bancroft really does have an excellent conservation team, that was one reason why some of those artworks ended up in the Bancroft. Also, the Bancroft has an excellent, like they're, they're publicly available. They're all cataloged and online, so anyone can find them now. So um, that's, a, that's a positive. And also, the Bancroft, uh, not only do they, own, do they have a small gallery in, in the library, which puts on excellent shows, um, but they, they lend works. Mm -hmm. um, so they are actually made publicly available. Um, now they're not in an art museum collection, right? But I think that that was a, you know, a, a push and pull uh, when we were making that decision. I also think that Bancroft appreciated getting some, some art pieces um, because it's prestigious for them, yeah. Did you have a question, Donna? If not, I have a follow-up question on, uh, not a question, but just a point that I'd like to make, and that is the Archives of American Art of the mm -hmm. Smithsonian also is a wonderful place um, for artists to contact and, and see about establishing whether or not that would be a viable place to donate your archives. And they likewise um, are willing to, um, and, and they, they're happy to, about this, they're happy to lend work for exhibitions. So they lend work out also. It's not just tucked away for research only forever and ever in the dark vault. So um, just wanted to add that information to you. Yeah, one thing I, I omitted to say, and I don't think the archives is very active at this time in collecting new oral histories, although they do have people uh, it, based in LA now who are uh, on the West Coast. Um, it goes up and down according to funding from Congress, as you can well imagine. But they're a wonderful resource. Um, those rec a lot of the recordings are online, and you can go there and listen in Washington, which I've done. It's a marvelous experience. There's, um, but oral history, you and your, your smartphone and um, a loved one can do. And that's another uh, worthwhile uh, thing to consider um, for legacy. Yes. Um, I'd rather you ask Tracy a question. Okay, um, certainly. So I'm not going to contribute to the archiving of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. With my image, if you don't mind, I just kind of move myself out of my home and move into the <laughs> Um, however, um, I'm interested in how you um, dealt with, you know, having David part of the state. How exciting! And I didn't know that about you. The question to Tracy was to please address talking about a little discussion about the David Park, the state of David Park. Uh, well, it it. You know, the David Park estate is sort of an odd duck in that uh, he died very young of cancer. There was no money. The family uh, struggled, you know, uh, thereafter. And he, uh, his daughters, uh, his wife, Lydia, and then his daughters took charge of work very late. Almost everything was sold one way or the other um, to make ends meet. 
Uh, he sold as much as he could before he died. He knew he was dying of cancer in 1960. So this was a situation where the body of work was small to begin with by any, any legacy stretch, and the work was well dispersed and held uh, in private and public collections. Um, so the remaining works that the family holds or held uh, is really kind of the trust. And uh, to tell you the truth, um, it's been uh, it, a lot of the shows we did of David Park were pulling things back from private collections and exhibiting them. Some were resales. There were some opportunities for the family to make a little more money. And of course, we made some money. But in general, it's been circulating in the private market. Um, and the family did hold on to some things to make for ma more major donations uh, at later times. And then it's mostly been convincing private owners to donate things. Um, uh, the books that have been done, it's all been labor of love by people who obviously think very uh, Park is, is a super important artist and should be better known. You know, the last major retrospective was at the Whitney a long time ago. And um, SF MoMA is planning a show which has been delayed numerous times uh, for various reasons. Um, but, you know, there's, um, it's kind of not a, a standard arrangement, but much more common in that generation, again, where people, um, had to pull things together posthumously, family did. Uh, Milton Avery's a, a very good example. Huge amount of work, a lot was sold over many decades, a lot was left. His star had dropped, no one really cared, you know, and this happens over and over. And then the reappraisals begin, right? Well, his daughter, March Avery, after his wife died, spent decades working on that. Uh, estate and uh, trying to pull enough sales together to fund the estate to make it possible to really document his career, which now, you know, is, is highly regarded again. But it, uh, it's really a labor of love in many cases. It has very little to do with the quality of the work and everything to do with what people are paying attention to and what's in fashion, and you have to make them pay attention. And it's a, uh, an incremental process. Mentioning Milton Avery is very interesting, I think, because I remember being at um, the San Francisco Art Fair out at Fort Mason um, one year, and suddenly I was seeing Milton Avery little watercolors, and then I was seeing them everywhere all of a sudden, and I said to somebody, where did all this come from? And they said, well, his wife just died, and they were all cut out of sketchbooks, and they were coming onto the market, mm -hmm. and it was, you know, another burst, and then shortly after the, the hammer, UCLA had a show of Milton Avery's. But it, it, that's also a very interesting thing that maybe um, you could address how, in fact, attention is cyclical and that if you don't keep bringing it back in front of the new audience, because it's always a new audience, um, it's just lost. Could you talk about that a little bit? Tracy, um, yeah, I stories. think it's it's true. I, I do think this is one of the areas where a um, whether it's a family member, uh, an art historian who takes it upon themselves, uh, galleries, of course, have an uh, economic motive for trying to keep work in front of people and trying to um, uh, keep things bubbling. Uh, in artist careers, and you see a lot of galleries. My gallery started out just showing contemporary living artists. Over time, we did add some uh, secondary market works, and then uh, more estates and um, or managers. And I, there are a couple people who uh, are paid by artists to manage their their work as they're working and producing. They take a little bit of the uh, cash flow. And then they can do outreach. They can help do publications. Uh, so someone needs to take hold of it periodically and say, "Wait a minute, you know, let's contact these curators. Do they know the work? What work we have? Has anyone uh, assembled a focus?" Manuel Neri is a great example. He's still alive, although very old now. Long career. It's gone up, down, and sideways in terms of public uh, perception. 
and um, different dealers over the years, but for a very long time he's had a manager, basically, who um, is extremely smart and does a lot of uh, yeoman's work to make sure that not only his gallery, which was my gallery and is now Hackett Mill, but that other galleries around the country are showing work, that uh, he, you know, there's a show in New York, that it, that dealer goes away, find a new dealer. Uh, she is coordinating um, a lot of material. She is talking with curators at museums who often are more interested than gallerists nowadays in reappraising work, you know doing all the heavy lifting, finding essayists, pe people finding art historians to come up with new angles. This stuff just doesn't happen on its own. It doesn't happen. There's too many artists, there's too, too much distraction. Uh, people get very siloed in their own work. Uh, they may be perfectly thrilled to discover uh, other things, but they're not necessarily gonna trip, trip over it. And so um, that kind of gentle, prodding and attention and reframing of work and uh, finding specific periods that people haven't looked at. Oh, you didn't know he did these collages in that period. Well, that's a whole new, that's not what you think of with Manuel Neri. You don't think of paintings, you think of sculptures. You know, so these kinds of, these kinds of things um, really help. Yes, Donna. This is great. I, I just wanted to say funding and artwork, us going back to that issue, my lawyer came up with something that I should pass along, which is the idea of a, a life insurance policy that is held by the trust, in effect. Yes. So yes. that you're paying a, a nominal amount annually, and it's, this, it, it's a term, you know, it's 75, it's over, but, the, but, but it's, it's not a total solution, but it's an important aspect of a solution that you can have a life insurance policy that yeah and I, I'd like to repeat that so that it is on videotape and we do have it because it's valuable and Donna was just um, bringing forward this recommendation of having a life insurance policy of which the beneficiary is your trust your so your artwork is the beneficiary of a policy you're paying in over time and then when the payout comes it's going to benefit your um, artwork in, in the estate. One of the other things about it too is it separates that from. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is all really valuable for everyone, and we'd like to have it recorded. Okay. So the other part of that too, you talked about. Everyone's mentioned in various ways, dealing with family issues and dealing with. And I think there's something that's very clean about having an artwork trust that's funded in a certain way that's completely separate from. Your, your estate and you know, your, your children and all that, it's just, it, it's cleaner. And, and this was suggested by uh, a, our lawyer who is, whose wife is a prominent photographer, and so he's grappled with this, how to set this up. Anyway, um, th that's a, just an option to have on the table. Because, I mean, how many people feel they can set aside half a million dollars or something? I mean, that's not many of us, so anyway. Thank you. Um, I would I would direct you to the um, Joan Mitchell Foundation and the fact that on the website they have these two wonderful resources that you can download. They are free. You can just download exactly um, one one is for um, archiving your work, and the other one is for um, dealing with the estate issues and. This is one of the recommendations that they make also. So um, they are really valuable. They're well worked out. And they are free. They're available to artists. It's a great, great resource and contribution that um, the foundation has made. So that's yeah, very easy to Joan, find. The Joan Mitchell Foundation. The Joan Mitchell Foundation. When I was, when I was you know, because I, I, I was learning while doing. Yeah. And um, it was extraordinarily helpful. So that's something that I would really follow up on. Talk. I was, I was thinking, um, as I was looking at your work, I was thinking about a piece that we have at the Richmond Art Center right now in the exhibition Earth, Wind, and Fire. And it is a piece by Joshua Solis, who is also uh, out at the Headlands right now with you. He's a fellow fellow 
out there. And he, his, his body cast is not af after working out, but after being told by his doctor that that's what he needs. <laughs> and so it's a self-portrait at 190, because it's 190 pounds, and he was told that he needed to um, actually get healthier. But I, I think it's really interesting that, um, that you have this work that forms a, a journal and, and, and is recording for you. But my question, because I did have a question, was um, do you, in fact, do writing that goes along with it? Are you doing, as, to, uh, as Tracy was saying, you know, keeping these records of your thoughts, not just visually, but in terms of you know, written language as well? Do you? I do. I, I keep a journal. So the journal um, kind of pages that you saw earlier are kind of like my notes. And then um, I started to dive deeper into writing here at Berkeley because I hate writing. <laughs> but my professors here, uh, Alan D'Souza, especially pushed me in several assignments to write uh, at length about my work. And so that it doesn't stay in your mind, you can actually spill it out on paper and generate new thoughts because it just gets too much up here. And so, yes, writing is really helpful. And also for events like these, whenever I'm invited to something like this, I, it generates notes that I keep. Yes, notes to keep, programs to keep. <coughs> Tracy, you were going to respond to that? Were you about to respond? Oh. I, I have something to say. Um, Sonia kept extensive notes. And she would always write the exact date of, of you know, uh, day of the month but she would never write the year, <laughs> which might have, might have seemed uh, evident at the time, and sometimes I can tell by ordering things that it could be. <laughs> so ever since I've worked with Sonia's archive, I, whenever I date something, I always write the year down. And um, I think that it, it has affected the way I keep, because I'm an artist as well, mm -hmm. and I also keep records of, of my curation, various projects. Um, and I would say I'm more organized now. I have, you know, went and bought a file, you know, cabinet. Um, <laughs> so um, seeing seeing this process kind of opened my eyes to the fact that um, these things that are very ephemeral to, to us um, can can suddenly become a, a record. Um, and if there's anything that that you can do now to make it so that people in the future can decipher your notes and can, can figure out what's worth keeping and what's not worth keeping, right? You can, if you can take on some of that work, um, then it's going to be a, a major boon for um, your legacy. I, I would like to say that at the Richmond Archives, Richmond Art Center Archives, we have a similar dilemma because for some reason, let's talk about the reason, there was in place, just like there's art jargon, there's art convention and no announcement has the year on it. That's right. So you look at announcements, you look at advertising um, copy that went out to print everything and it has, it has the dates and it has no year. Now, when I think back, because I was active back in those years, um, there was this idea that we knew exactly what was going on. We knew what was happening. It was of the moment. We, we, we knew. Um, and I think we all trusted memory as well in terms of ordering. And we saw the logic in how things evolved so that we would know absolutely when you know, one cube was there and when suddenly there were three cubes and when suddenly something was actually up against the wall. And so there'd be no problem to sort of order it. But in fact, looking back over years, that's really <laughs> failing, totally failing. Yes, Terry. Uh, Thank you. First of all, thank you to all of you. The Every, each presentation, they were very compatible and also, I think, really critical. Um, and I guess um, two things about, um, about the presentation. Um, will people know that this is available to them via whatever it is, YouTube or other media? Because I think it's really important. I don't think that artists always know, or people in the field, 
But in terms of dating, I wanted to say as an art historian and a curator and a writer, it's so essential. Um, I've done a lot of work with, with archives, including uh, with Sonia's, um, and it's very hard. Um, and so what do we do? We go to the internet. So when you're on the internet, what do you find? Sometimes um, you find two or three competing dates for a particular event. So um, having that primary source material is, is really important, and thank you for bringing that up. So um, we have actually um, already online some videos of past symposia, and this will be available. And so what we will do is send out, if you received an email from the Alumni Association about this event, you and everyone else who didn't walk in our door but received one will know. We will have this posted. We have a Facebook page. Um, Farley has done incredible outreach, and it will be there, and you are welcome to share it with everyone you know. Just, you know, share it with friends, ask them to share it, because we hope that this will be useful. I, I found it really inspiring when Tracy spoke of how she had to reinvent herself when uh, one way, one mode of being in the art world and relating to art changed after over 20 years. and the idea that she set for herself. And she, she talked about this as being really exciting. <laughs> and I, I think all artists should take that as a model because we tend to dread going out and knocking on doors or contacting or phoning. And I think to see it as a really exciting, you know, new chapter where you turn the page, it was really, um, it, it's really inspiring and thrilling to hear that, Tracy. So. Thanks, Jan. If, if I can add a, a pitch for um, your fellow artists and galleries, if, if there are exhibitions that your friends are in, show up. Get to the opening, if at all possible. Uh, I was always struck by um, how poorly artists attended openings. And I know the Bay Area transit, et cetera, is a, a problem now. Uh, however, in LA, I see people get there. Um, and they have worse problems. So I do think it means a lot to your peers and to your community, and it's actually helpful for your own career um, to be more visible. Don't just stay at home. Um, don't be afraid. I knew there were artists who, who didn't want to show up and then not like the work and then be asked by their friend, what do you think of it, or you know, have to render an opinion. Don't worry about it. Just show up. and. Um, that strengthens the ties of the community. It strengthens our region, which is a really big, vibrant region, but it is uh, uh, this idea that everyone's too busy to get there is, I think, uh, destructive. And many, many, uh, at least in the gallery world, many of them get together one night a month, one uh, weekend a month, and do openings. So it's easy to see seven shows or to to get to your friends things. So this is the point at which this is the point at which I ask talk to invite everyone to the headlands. Oh. Oh, <laughs> yes, um, please come. We have a open house on the 15th of October. I believe that's a Sunday, so it's just right around the corner. It's from 12 to 5. It's tough to park because they historically have about 5 to 700 attendees. But if you can come that would be great. I'm in building 960. Um, and there are three buildings that will be open, all artist studios, um, artists in residence, I'm a graduate fellow, and then there are affiliates. So there are many, many studios to visit on that one day. October 15th from 12 to 5. Address? Oh, um, it's in Sausalito. It's, it's the Headlands, and if you Google online the Headlands, you'll find directions. And, um, and if anybody wants to carpool, call me. I mean, email me or anything. Well, you can call me, too. I Actually, I'm an old phone person. <laughs> but Tracy's laughing because I put out a, an email to friends yesterday about carpooling. But I would love to carpool. Can I just make a quick comment about um, artists and relationships? Would you please come home? It's going to answer this. And the importance of those relationships. Um, thank you again. Thank you again. For, for this panel. It's actually been a great panel, and the way you all incorporated and mended together, as it was referenced before. Um, 
So basically, I just wanted to comment on artist relations. We're dealing right now with generations of artists that are passing away. And these particular artists were correspondence on paper. So that paper correspondence, all those letters, save those letters. Those letters are really important. Don't let your family throw them away. And then in terms of a generation now with digitizing, go through your emails with these new generations. Go through your emails, copy those emails, print those out right now, start filing those away, because those are gonna get lost. And those could be important correspondence with a curator, with another artist. So that really is an important thing to think about right now in relation to your legacy. So just a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks very much. That's, that's great. Um, do we have time? Let's do one more question Please, then, yeah, Jan. One more I want to then then briefly say lunch, something we'll about that. Yeah, we're, we'll, we have time for your, for your question, Donna, and then we'll take lunch. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say I really appreciated what you said about community and when I th and I was thinking about the way you were imagining the arc of your life as an artist and I think we all it's it's fascinating because I feel like I'd like to be able to talk to my younger self and say what some things that I've learned at this stage I've been working for 40 years and so it's a really different and I think one of the main things I would say to myself is to not be so fearful, to be braver, which may not be an issue for you, but I think it is for a lot of people, mm -hmm. and to, to really support and care about my community greatly, because everything good that's happened in my working life has come through people I care about, really. And so that it's not just about you in the sense of ego, you being recognized, it's, uh, 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 which I think is the way we tend to see it when we're younger. We tend to see it as our accomplishment and our trajectory and, and this and that and the other thing. And I think that what I feel now is that it's really about this community and this process that you are embedded in and how that nourishes you and you can nourish others. It's a reciprocity. Thank you so much for that. Thank I actually, um, I, I I think that's put so well. Um, I, I think artists sometimes forget that you're a part of a history and a community. And for example, with Sonia's archives, uh, there is a ton of correspondence in there with other people. And so by preserving her archives, we're not just preserve, it's not just all about the ego of Sonia. It's, it's about um, an, an entire slice of history as told through the, the collection of one person. Um, so uh, certainly uh, the archives that are in the Bancroft now would be an, an excellent source of, of research for people who are interested in, in the Bay Area figurative school or in you know, the history of, of uh, art and technology other than just uh, Sonia's practice. So it's, it's absolutely accurate that you're doing it for more than just yourself. Thank you. Um, I have to do one thing now, and that is I have to um, thank you all for joining us this morning, but I also have to make a pitch and um, pass our symbolic hat around, because as you know, um, this, yes, yes, <laughs> this, this, this has, um, you know, we're, we're determined not to have a registration fee for this, but we do feel, for instance, that having a video is crucial. We need money for this. We, um, thank you, could you pass that? Great. Um, would you like to take one on the other side? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we want to be able to come back next year. We want to be able to really uh, be responsive to the needs of the art community in the Bay Area. Berkeley and beyond. Yes, Farley. Can I say something, Jen? Uh, first of all, I just uh, thank you all so much for being so generous. I really do hope that the uh, art alumni group can um, use these funds to do an even a better symposium next year and the year after that and after that. Um, I wanted to specifically thank um, 
Katie Revia and Jin Zhu for helping me to organize this, as well as Jan, who, and Jan and Carol, who did a fabulous job. And I also wanted to mention what I've had on the screen for a while, which is um, something that, and this is only for our art alumni, but um, what I've done is created a um, form online that anyone can access. And the, this form is so that you can put some information in what's basically a directory, but it's an online directory. So this online directory is for our alumni, and it includes not only your name and contact information, if you choose to put it there, um, but it, it talks about uh, community and mutual aid, because so much of what um, the, the things that have happened to me in, in, in my career have been because of my friends and my peers and my colleagues. And a lot of, uh, as artists, a lot of you are artists, you know that um, uh, there's a lot of skill exchange, there's a lot of helping each other out, and I just wanted to create a resource to facilitate that. So um, I will uh, look at your original email invite, it's got a link to this, and I'll be sending out more information about this form. And then if you do fill out the form, and only if you fill out the form, you'll have access to a directory of people. And it includes um, questions about what kinds of services you might be able to provide or what kinds of services you might be seeking. And hopefully we can connect people who have complementary needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we're looking forward to sharing lunch with you, break, baking, breaking, breaking bread. <laughs> and, um, and then to the afternoon where we will um, have these wonderful presentations by Joey Inas, Patricia Maloney, and Maria Porges. So thank you all for this great morning and um, look forward to having lunch together. Thank you.